Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first in the Susie Wong Presents series of talks called Exchange. We are very honored today to have Heike Dempster and talking to in conversation with Storm Salter today. Um, I'm Suzanne Fredericks. I run Susie Wong Presents. I'm just going to do a quick introduction for, of Heike and Storm, and then uh, Heike will be in conversation with Storm. Um, any questions you might have throughout the talk, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, we, will, we will ask questions at the end and have a look at those. Um, thank you, Heike, for being here. Very honored to have you. Um, Heike Dempster is an art writer and artist, arts administrator. After graduation from London Metropolitan University in London, UK, and the University of the West Indies in Kingston, Jamaica, Heike lived and worked in, as a writer and TV and radio host and producer in Jamaica and the Bahamas. In 2012, she were relocated to Miami, Florida, where she works in arts administration for National Young Arts Foundation, focused on public relations, collaborations, and cultural partnerships, and has made a name as an art writer consultant and is a respected member of the arts community. In her writing, Dempster focuses on Africa, the Caribbean, and the diaspora. Her articles and essays have been published in, amongst others, in Aesthetica, Art Districts, Art Pulse, Rooms, Art Uncovered, and White Wall Magazine. I'm just going to let a couple of people in, sorry. <laughs> Here we go. That's a pause in my intro. Um, Heike will be talking to Storm Salter. <clears throat> Storm is a, is a well-established filmmaker from Negril, Jamaica, um, an emerging visual artist. Also, just, just really getting his teeth into his artistic practice. Um, in context to contemporary to the contemporary art world. Um, best known for his award-winning films, Better Must Come and Sprinter, Storm has also directed music videos for Chronix, Arcade Fire, Protege and Popcorn, and is also a commercial director working with Usain Bolt and brands like Puma, Red Stripe and Angostura. Storm has served as the first filmmaker in residence at the University of the West Indies in Mona, Jamaica, and co-founded the New Caribbean Cinema Collective um, which is a group of emerging Caribbean filmmakers. His photography has been published in Rolling Stone magazine and The Fader, and his experimental film and art photography work has been exhibited at the Brooklyn Museum, the British Museum, the National Gallery of Jamaica, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Miami, <clears throat> and most recently at Peel Art Gallery Museum and Archives in Canada in their current show, When Night Stirred at Sea. Thank you both for being here. Uh, Storm's work is on show at the Prism Art Fair, currently with Susie Wong Presents, which is why we're having this conversation. So I'm going to hand over to Heike. Thanks everyone for being here. And we look forward to an exciting and interesting conversation. Well, yes, we are. I hope so. Thanks so much for having, letting me have this conversation with Storm, who well, I've known for many years, we're not sharing how many. <laughs> um, <laughs> But yeah, so obviously Storm as an artist, filmmaker, photographer, I wanted to start by just you talking a bit about the exercise of looking back into your photography archives, what prompted that exercise and what have you learned about yourself, etc. Yeah man, blessings. Well, thank you. Um, bless up Suzanne, thank you. Um, Susie Wong presents for, for this and for this show. And thanks, Heike. I've um, been looking forward to this conversation. You know, in terms of me looking back into this work, you know how it is, like, um, you know, I started with photography, you know, so for me, my first real, like, lightning rod moment of me feeling just like this is what I was made to do was when I picked up a camera. Um, and that led to my interest in cinematography, which led to directing and writing. But I come from the visual side which means, you know, I'm always taking pictures and I like to take pictures that are like, you know, portraiture or just random textural stuff. I love to shoot signage. So like whether I'm on a job doing a shoot or I'm just like walking around with whatever phone, I'm always grabbing stuff. And, you know, but it takes so much energy to make movies that I spend all my time writing them and pitching them and trying to just make it happen that, you know, and even though I exhibit work every so often, I just have tons of images that have never been seen. And it's all kinds of images, you know, from, as I say, personal phone stuff to like 
filming um, musicians and athletes and behind the scenes of sets. So it's a lot of random stuff. Um, and I just felt like there was so much there. So I just wanted to see what was there, you know? And then when I started to go through the um, work, I just saw themes and things coming up, you know, like I saw repetition of certain things that I was drawn to at total different times in my life, in different countries, in different places. And I would just gather those pieces and gather images from the tens of the thousands that spoke to me. And then it was like a process of just finding connections between them. Um, and sometimes the connection starts in just something visual like the color. I mean, the piece that's up right now um, on the screen, Mad Sikhed, you know, I th the brown in this is what brought it together first, I think, or what made these images kind of like remind me of each other as I was figuring out a narrative. And, um, and I just, for me, it's like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to put these images together to tell a coherent story. And it's either sometimes the story is reinforcing the same point over and over. Sometimes it just feels like a scene. And, um, and they, I mean, just to add, there was a moment where I couldn't figure out how to show this work. And it kind of clicked when I thought, let me do it like storyboards. Let me do it as if I'm editing a scene in a film. And then, then the, the images could make sense, the scale and the way how they're laid out very clearly like storyboards. Yeah, I was getting to the idea of a storyboard and, and how you create these narratives from disparate images. And I mean, this one, obviously, having lived in Jamaica at the time when also that song came out, Matzik had no good. I just, every time I look at this image, I can hear like Kip Rich in the background. Um, but we're getting back to some of the more specific dance or references in just a moment. Um, before we get to that, I was looking at one of your works called Untitled and really look at how much your work is rooted in movement, but then you also look at you know, shape and how you use space and composition. So I wanted to talk a bit more general on that first. Sure, um, with this piece in particular, um, you know, first of all, like the image on the left was photographed in Cuba. Um, the image in the middle was photographed in, in Jamaica in near Port Royal in an old um, colonial era, like Navy graveyard. There's graves if you see behind the figure that are from like the 1700s and so on. And then on the right, that was a photograph just from a sidewalk in New York of obviously a, a crushed bird. Now, for me, like, there's a few things that are playing with this piece. It, first of all, is the shapes, you know, like the wings of the bird taking off, the, the figure in the middle, um, and the wings of the, the, the dead bird are, are at the same angle and, and, and in a way it seemed to increase in size as you go across. Um, so that was the first thing that drew those images. I mean, I'm also being very literal here with like a transition through death, you know, bird being the, the you know, birds are life. It's kind of like the image that we use to represent that. And then this figure in the middle, which is a person changing out of something, but I just caught him in a moment where you couldn't see any of his body and it's just a strange shape. And to me, to me, it looks like a grim reaper, you know, um, when I think of like film images and stuff. And um, so like, I feel like this is very literal um, and uh, it's the, 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 the scale, the negative space around the images are very, you know, it's kind of very clear what I'm talking about. Um, but these images are from totally different times and periods, you know? Um, and can you, so really quick, sorry, I, I know I'm going, but the image before, Mad Sikhed, can you just go back up there for me, um, Suzanne? I just wanted to say one more thing about this image I just wanted to say was, you know, I'd mentioned that the color is what maybe first brought it together, but then what kind of brought me in deeper was it's operating on a few different levels, like that brown that's moving through is being found in a rusting you know, wall, wall, obviously that has this graffiti and I'm always shooting street signs and graffiti. Um, and then that colors in this guy's skin. And then it's also in this rock and in this woman walking away. And in a way it's like, it's three types of matter. It's skin, it's metal, it's rock. And it's all kind of has this consistent color. 
And then there's this narrative, what do those words mean? This man in the middle has his dazed look and his woman is walking away, is he looking at her? So there's a sense of a story about to jump off and, and this piece, I just kind of wanted to mention that because this piece I think shows it pretty clearly, but we can jump back down now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think we can actually go two down because I think one of the mo most important um, images in the in out of the pieces that are showing at, at Prism Art Fair um, is Ring Around the Rosie. And that brings us really back to, I mean, so many themes that are in your work from dance or references to the larger Jamaican political and cultural context and history. Like you see um, how you see the movement again, but also you see kind of contemporary dance hall culture encompassing this um, image of like decaying colonial history, right? So I think that's definitely a piece that stands out a lot. So I think we need to talk a little bit more about it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, this piece, everything from the title to how like specifically composed it is, how graphic it is in a way, um, it's kind of something that I'm going for. This is kind of the nth degree of a certain visual style that I'm trying to achieve. But beyond that, like I think of Ring Around the Rosie, I remember that game. I remember it is like another kid's game, like Spin the Bottle is kind of associated with the same grouping of games. And I kind of imagine this piece working more than this flat at being three dimensional and this woman being, you know, maybe there's many of her circling around this, this sculpture. and. For me, um, in a filmic way, I thought the, the silhouettes of her, especially the one on the left felt like, I don't know, there was a, a, a horror movie feeling to it for a moment, like a Nosferatu kind of image. And, and I felt whoever she's walking towards should be afraid, you know? Um, while at the same time, knowing it's this woman dancing, it was just a, a moment captured. And then the character in the middle, who is this, you know, um, old king, some English king and um, King Edward, I don't remember, we still don't remember the name, but. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was King Edward, yes. Yeah, so I remember, you know, this image, this, this sculpture, the statue is in the middle of Halfway Tree on the clock, which is at the center of Halfway Tree, which culturally and otherwise kind of represents the center of Kingston, the center of the culture, the pathways. It's referenced even in Junior Gang's album, Halfway Tree speaks about it as the center ground between uptown, downtown, etc. So to me, it's this, it's this lightning point. And this, why is this guy there? And then uh, that was the first thing I felt. And then I got close and I saw that his, he was looking really gnarly. His nose has been chiseled off. His upper lip has been chiseled off. His teeth are exposed. His, one of his eyes is almost gouged out. So clearly somebody put some effort into mangling this colonial statue, um, which I thought, all right, cool, at least, you know, like, <laughs> and to me, you know, it made me think of a few things. One, his nose being gone made me think of the, the blowing off of the nose of the Sphinx and trying to erase history by, you know, messing with the, the face. Um, it also made me, you know, like I shot this piece before, but the relevance of it now with statues and statues being torn down all over the place because of what they represent and so on. I feel like the fact, you know, that this, that conversation is very much at play here. And these women are almost moving around this figure, taunting him, taunting this rotting, rosy figure you know even that's even his skin tone would be rosy you know what i mean so mm -hmm. that's kind of how this is a piece that is kind of like for me visually it's working on a certain way that i really like because i'm very much into design and so on and then there's just many layers on top of it also one more element i think is really important is the context within which this image was captured this i was there was a march on um, the tambourine army which you know there was they had a march against gender-based violence this this was you know the beginning of a movement that was kind of kicked off when a pastor of the moravian church was caught with an underage girl you know raping her essentially and had had been having you know all this stuff it was this big outcry right and this there was this major march and i had marched with um the folks and just took pictures along mm -hmm. the way and the energy was quite interesting because there were people along the way that didn't really see, you know, react how we thought they would. And so there was a lot of energy in the air when I got to this statue, you know, and even the fact that this statue is being surrounded and taunted by these women is, is connected to how the, the context 
of when I captured it. You know, it, it was definitely the way I felt about the image. So that's another piece that you wouldn't know if I didn't tell you, but it put my mind in the, in the place to find these other images to pair with it. Yeah. yeah, and I think, and I mean, I think you spoke about it on another like, occasion. What's relevant here is also like it's a very timely piece in a, in in the context of of statues being torn down, um, you know, markers of colonial histories being torn down, etc. Worldwide, really. So I think it quite um, ties in with that as well. Yeah, big time, um, big time. And I mean, look, for me as a filmmaker, I'm always looking to, you know for things to have impact visually otherwise. And, um, you know, I think that's what helps me to edit the work as well. It's like, is this really saying something that, that speaks beyond what it is? And uh, that's kind of what I'm always looking for in work. And I mean, continuing our conversation on, on, on Jamaican history as well. I mean, one of the outstanding pieces that really grabs attention, of course, is also the piece master. Um, and for me, I mean, I recently actually saw an, uh, a video installation at the Museum of Modern Art in Frankfurt with an installation about Franz Fanon, and um, that mentions obviously his book, uh, Black Skin, White Mask, uh, historical critique on the effects of, of racism and, and, and colonial domination. And that's where my mind immediately went with this. But then I know you pointed out um, the luck as well. So I want you to speak a bit more about this piece. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, again, this piece being also like a, a diptych, it's kind of like from a composition standpoint, it's it's if you were to lay these images on top of each other, I'm sure those chains would probably be coming out of the eyes of the white face, you know. Um, and if you and also the, the the light and dark, it's kind of an inverse, you know, there's a bit of negative space, etc. But but it's it's inverse on each image. So there's that butterfly effect. I think this image is like a butterfly without being an, a literal butterfly. But then when you zoom into the chain and you see the lock, it says across the lock master. It's a brand of lock, you know what I mean? That I'm actually familiar with. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, you know, and then on the other side, there's this young man, you know, with this white face essentially lifted, but his face is still obscure you know, by his own hand and even the shape of his hand while it might've been captured as some kind of like West side kind of gang sign and energy. It also kind of mimics the shape of the V of the chain. So I just think it's it's working visually. It's very clear. And I mean, yes, what you mentioned with Fanon and, you know, it's obviously like speaking to that, you know, um, this is like, this is like an image that feels like a butterfly. It feels like a mirror image and it feels like the statement is kind of very clear. And I do try to make things obvious sometimes, like I'm not really trying to be super subtle. I think the work should just say <laughs> what it has to say. You know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah, and I think, I mean, since we are we are talking about history, we're also talking about uh, all of the dance or references in your work and how much that relates to claiming of space, et cetera. But I think there are so many obviously very intentional um, decisions made on how you present that. I think what's also interesting is when you look at the next piece that we that we very deliberately chose, which is um, Black Cartel, um, about dance hall and specifically also about how gender identity is um, represented and masculinity specifically. And what always, um, what I always found when I did a lot of research on the topic when I was at the University of the West Indies was how much you can understand about Jamaica at large once you understand dance hall because it exaggerates all these notions that are already in place in Jamaica and I think as as many Jamaican cultural markers that are in the work there are also a lot of very specific and intentional markers that point to dance hall to understand Jamaica mm -hmm. so I see a lot of that in this work so I think um, I'd be, I'm very interested in, in in Black Cartel and the story behind this composition here yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, f you know, I'm a, I'm a dancehall youth. I grew up on dancehall. That's would be my music, you know, like, you know, anybody, you know, kind of my age and, and et cetera. And also just living through like the birth and explosion of it. So, you know, it's kind of the story of my, you know, the soundtrack of my growth as a Jamaican man as well, you know, and um, kind of the ideas of who the ultimate Jamaican man is 
you know what I mean? Especially because our artists are so powerful and have so much influence. I always imagine a certain artist to kind of be the ultimate representation. From for many years, it was Bounty Killer to me, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of like he set the standard for the Jamaican man in the larger sense, you know. Um, and I feel, and then when Cartel came along, you know, he became and is still that in my opinion. Um, but it just flipped the whole game, you know. And the fact, like, so this piece is called Black Cartel. So already, you know. Cartel and, and skin bleaching, you know, it's already a major, you know, thing in terms of the, his, you know, him being a part of it and being a, such a public figure with that. And this is, this was photographed before that era. This was actually photographed mm -hmm. with JMT album. The image on the right is the cover image for his album called JMT. Um, on the album version though, I'll kind of jump back between how I shot this image and kind of how the meme <laughs> keeps keeps coming. But, uh, but this is the actual version that I delivered um, to the label. Um, I designed those glasses, all of that. And I took this image and that's a real kid in a, in, a, in a house holding something in his hand. And you can imagine what it is, what it looks like, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they actually changed that on the album cover because I guess of what it was saying, but this is actually the raw original image. And you jump out from what that is, just a kid with this gun, you know what I mean? And then the shape of his head is obviously throwing to the, the continent of Africa. Um, that's just one of the first things that hits you from a shape, you know, perspective. So what, you know, I'm trying to think about that, his, his skin, you know, he's even darkened even more here, you know what I mean? Because of how it was photographed. And, you know, obviously all those conversations, um, all those things are layering on top of each other and hopefully making people think. And then on the other side, you know, it's mirrored with, this cross and this machete. Now that image just came about because those were props from a music video that were hanging in the office. And we just, there's actually some nails holding up the cross and we put the machete there. And that was just sitting there for months. And it was just an image that kind of got burned into my brain and I just snapped it randomly. And then, you know, these two kind of play off with each other. So clearly the, the role of religion, the cross I you see repeated in my work a lot because I, it's so everywhere. It's in everything and how we think and in how we move. Um, so it's in the work, but then also the connection with like violence and the rationalization of violence through religion and the, the impact that has had on, you know, folks all over the world, but obviously Jamaicans, people of the African diaspora, you know, so there's, Kind of a lot of things being touched off on this but also it, it's it's even more extreme in terms of like the graphic like this is one of the only pieces where i've like manipulated the image and cut out the background and that type of thing um i sometimes try to create that environment with my photographs in camera but this to me represents an ultimate side of that and then obviously you know it's cartel man i mean <laughs> you know, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I remember meeting Cartel at, 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 I mean, way before this picture was taken, but before also the bleaching and all that. And I think, I mean, this would be a whole other um, conversation of the impact of that and the significance of, of those decisions. Um, but I mean, just staying with the masculinity and um, Cartel and dancehall and the whole exaggeration, I think, I mean, there's obviously always, um, and I think you used that term before as well, like this performative mm -hmm. masculinity that we often see. And what I was thinking, um, looking at your work and what went to my mind was, okay, there is um, the subject of the pho photograph or the, um, the film that is always, that is performing, that also therefore holds some type of agency, but once you create an image that is or share an image that's almost like a behind the scenes or a more intimate moment that agency shifts away to the audience right but dance very much is about the claiming of agency so i was just wondering how you approach that like do you think that agency lies with the with the subject in your work um because there is that performative element to it and that awareness of the camera um yes i do think and because the images, because the um, the the all the people in front of the camera were knew I was taking their photo, so they were projecting the version of themselves that they did feel 
felt what they were trying to, to push. And, I, and I, so I do think they definitely, and I am trying to always elevate and I am influenced by like Renaissance art and, you know, certain type of like types of images that like have searing impact. And, you know, like I, I am trying to create that. I'm trying to create iconic stuff with this work. And I do think, so, so I am trying to put that there and I do think they claim that, you know, um, as I said, so cause none of the images of people were they like that I would capture randomly when they weren't looking, you know? But I do think, you know, when I, when I put that image with one of these other images that might be a word texture thing, it absolutely changes the context. So now that, so right. that they become really a character in a larger thing. And maybe even, maybe their role changes. Like maybe, maybe the image in the image master, you know, maybe the power dynamic would feel different if it was the, one of those images on their own. You know what I mean? But when the master comes now, it's starting to operate on all these kind of levels. And um, that's the thing about photography that I love, that's beautiful. And I think it's made me a better filmmaker is I'm always trying to tell as much of a story with a single image, like be as clear about what I'm trying to, to say. Um, and I, I think a single photograph can really be beautifully just capture a moment that feels forever when you look at it. But I think when you start to pair images, you know, once it's more than just visually nice, you, it just, the, the, the narrative potential just gets greater every time you add an image, you know what I mean? Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was, th I mean, I, I was getting to that too, like moving away a bit from the Jamaican culture narrative, but to storytelling at large or in, in, a bit more in general, like how with your storyboards, but also with your um, background as a filmmaker and with your ways of looking at narrative, um, how, how you look at like beginning, end or like continuity when you present this work, like where does the viewer come in to, you know, continue the thoughts and whatever narratives and explorations are in the work. Well, I think of each of these pieces as storyboards in a very literal sense. And they're either the beginning, the middle or the end of a scene, you know? Um, and especially when we get into like the three image work, you know, it becomes even more of like a movement, you know, because you have three story points. And I intend to do more with larger and longer, you know, um, stories. But for me, you know, I decided to present the work at this scale with the same size moving across to be specifically like how you would plot out a scene, you know? So like, for example, when I, this image here, these images came together because I put myself in the mindset of if I was editing the scene where I wanted to capture this feeling, which are the shots that I would use? And I, and I, so I kind of, I can like hear the birds taking mm -hmm. off. Like I imagine it with sound, you know? I hear the birds taking off. I, I, you cut to the reaction of this person looking up to the birds and then there's this slam close up of this uneasiness right in your face. It's like a macro shot, you know? Um, you don't know what type of surface it's on, it's on, but I just thought if I was watching a scene of this, a movie with sound, I'd be like, yo, what's going to happen next? This is, <laughs> this is interesting. <laughs> what, you know, I need, who's uneasy? Is he uneasy? What's, the, you know? Um, and I think my, I have a vivid imagination, you know what I mean? So I can kind of go there and I think I'm hoping that the work does that. You know what I mean? That is the intention. Yeah. It's like, yo, just imagine like, maybe the birds are coming from somewhere maybe this guy is is rushing and also what people don't know about this image what most people don't guess if i don't tell you is that is actually usain bolt in the middle yeah That's i didn't recognize it either right away but it, but it, but just how he was caught with the light he almost doesn't look alive you know it's a very you know kind of void you know i don't know almost like an empty um thing or it kind of you know and it's funny because i have a whole photo series of old flying a drone we were doing a, a a commercial thing and at the end of the commercial he wanted to fly his drone and he was up in the blue mountains and it was there's actually a piece i'm gonna finish with it <laughs> but this is from that this is why he's looking up in the sky against a complete white background because he's flying his drone up in blue mountains and i was just photographing and kind of you know he's um you know he has fun with his toys you know he's kind of that type of guy so you know it's interesting these things came on the image on the left was from cuba this was Jamaica, uneasiness was New York somewhere, you know? So for me, like, 
this is a scene and uh, I feel like it's happening in different places, different times in my life. And, you know, we have spoken about this and I'm, and before, but, you know, for me, like I'm moving through life so fast. And sometimes I don't know if it's just me or everybody feels this way, but sometimes stuff is just passing by. You know, you have amazing experiences. You go to new places. You have you discover things for the first time, and you have those feelings, and like then they're gone. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And you're like, and then I remember going through when I first put my first film out, and I started to be able to travel a lot. I would, you know, social media was becoming more of a thing, you know, and you wanted to photograph everything because it was so cool. And I went through a period <laughs> of just photographing everything and not feeling it. And I was like, shit, I did all mm -hmm. that. Stuff. I don't really remember it. And then I started to like not photograph everything so I could feel the things I was experiencing. So I'm always having this battle of documenting or not. And the thing about this exercise, what has kind of made it cool for me is that I'm f picking up little bits of memories of things I probably forgot about. Um, and I'm able, and then I'm mixing them up with other memories, other things. So a lot of this stuff is just me shooting on the random, most of this work. Right. And I'm kind of like repurposing these memories and I'm giving them life. And I'm kind of able, you know, for me, it kind of reminds me of those moments. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, I think that actually gets us back to the beginning in some sense, because I think I kind of combined two questions that we never got to the second part, which was like, what did you also learn about yourself in that process of going through these archives and looking at these works um, to create these new narratives? But like for yourself as a person, did that, what else did you learn about yourself or think about yourself going through that exercise? Yeah, no, it, it definitely, um, you know, like I think, I'll, you know, I'm, I think a lot, my brain, like I don't even communicate with people. I'm not the best communicator and I don't even realize it because I'm just always internal. I always have like multiple creative ideas I'm trying to do. So sometimes I just feel like, as I said before, it's like, Am I really in these moments? And for me, it got me to kind of like feel good about those, you know, like that journey, you know what I mean? And about those things, you know, there's that Walcott poem that they always talk about, you know, look in the mirror and feast on your life. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, it was amazing, right? And I always thought it was touching and I was like, um, it's true, like your life should feel, you know? And I feel like that's what this work has helped to bring up, you know? Okay. Well, what I also just noticed actually is that we started the first um, piece, Matzik Head actually has a text image to the left. And this last piece, Uneasiness, has a text image to the right. So that's just a random observation that just came to me now that we're starting with a text piece and kind of ending with a text piece, even though we don't want to end it. It's a continuation, right, of the work. So, I mean, I'm looking also at the times. So I think we probably should um, see if anybody had any questions. But also just to let everyone know, so you can look back at these works and they're also available at Suzy Wong Presents in the PRISM Art Fair showroom right now. And PRISM is still open since it's virtual this year until December 21. And so you can also check out some more of the works and look at them with more time and in detail, et cetera. But uh, let me see, I guess I'm the one who needs to look if we have any questions. <laughs> well, Alana was saying, I think that was about the Black Cartel piece that it seemed like surrealistic and sheds new light on surrealism of Christianity. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there was a follow-up question because then I guess we could just ask Alana to unmute herself and ask it if she wants. Yeah, man. Oh, hey, um, no, I, well, first of all, thanks for invite, inviting me, Heike, and um, nice to sort of meet you, Storm. Um, um, it's, I'm a person of um, Afro-Caribbean heritage and grew up in Brooklyn, but I live in Minnesota now. <laughs> so it's kind of nice to hear this talk about the space, and I don't know much about the Jamaican culture. I mean, not deeply, not much, um, yeah. but it just struck me some, I just had that, that thought came to me watching your images storm that that one with vibe cartel um and i just thought surrealism and it's really just uh aesthetically <laughs> i don't know deeply what i even mean by that but then i thought well if that is appearing to me as surrealism you know these days i've been exam i'm an artist as well i'm a dancer choreographer 
these days I've been examining my own mytho mythography of my life and all of the ideas that I have come to know and assume our beliefs or assume as the nature of reality, which is shifting now. Um, and I thought about that in the light of Christianity because I was raised in a, I guess, yeah, a Protestant, I guess, I don't know how you call it, evangelical home. So those are all just thoughts that's bur burning in my brain. And then I have my cut list here on my altar and I'm thinking about the cut list and about war and I'm still reading the Black Jacobins and I'm thinking about resistance and revolution and like, what does those things even mean? And then you put them right next to each other, the cross and the cut list. And I just thought that was, whoa, powerful and surreal, somehow not real, but more real because of the definition. So anyway, thank you, that's all. <laughs> Yeah, man, that, that, that's really lovely to kind of hear, you know, that, you know, it means a lot, you know, like, uh, it's funny, like, when you show work, a lot of this work is being shown for the first time, and it's like, for me, I, like, seed ideas in things, and I see if they come back, even with film stuff, it's like, you, I kind of think it means this, but then someone sees it, and it affects them a certain way, and then you're like, yo, it, it really, you know, you kind of realize the places that it, it kind of dips to and I'm definitely you know a fan of surrealism and also you know like I also think of language a lot not only words but just iconography what it's saying what it's pushing how things are used and reused and like you know that's why that cross just keeps showing up everywhere you know what I mean whether it's on some old statue or it's tattooed on the face of a you know <laughs> serious young man or it's tattooed on the chest or it's on a thing or or you know even what you look at now with how you know people use it as a political rallying cry you know what i mean and i mean that is alluding now to like the use of the machete i mean it's playing off in america right now obviously and in all over the world forever you know what i mean so so yeah i mean I just hope that we're, the images unlock something and start a story, you know? Yeah, we had, um, I had another question as well from Shireen. She said, you mentioned that you're trying to achieve a visual style with Matt Sick Head. What visual style is that? Um, with Matt Sick Head, uh, what I, okay, I would say that one, I think about, it's very lush, like something about that image feels so lush. You know what I mean? I don't know if it's just because I think of earth when I think of brown or I, I think of the elements when I see like the metal and the rock and everything, but I feel like there's a very, um, there's a certain energy in that piece that is not in every, you know, that piece almost has a, a sound or a, or a smell or something. You know what I mean? For me, um, at the same time, like, and I think because of the center image with, you know, this kind of classic portraiture, this very angelic, almost looking man, looking at this forbidden fruit, you know, for me that it's a man, for me it was always a forbidden fruit when you see that look in his eye. It's a mango as opposed to an apple, which is obviously what I love, cause that is really what the, what the forbidden fruit would be in our context. And um, I think how centered he is and how he looks reminds me of Renaissance, portraiture stuff and and for me like and I feel like even though it's a flat image of a wall and a portrait and then another image with kind of dimensions the composition is very geared towards the center in each one so I feel like it's three very different images that feel very connected and I do I do feel because the center image was uh yes it's something sensory I'm seeing um yeah in your, in your comment yeah that yeah exactly that's that's how i feel like i look at a piece i'm like yo i can smell this piece you know um uh so so yeah i was trying to i was trying to achieve that sensory feeling while also making the artwork feel grand and it's like why kahinde wiley does those huge pieces man you know what i mean it's not the same thing at all but there's a certain um thing that you're going for, grandia, yeah, I don't know what to call it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the century is definitely true because I, I feel like, as you said, you can almost smell the fruit, but you can also like, you can always hear, to me, when I look at your work, I can always hear the music. I can see the movement. I can feel the movement. It, it definitely goes beyond just the visual, even though it's presented in a visual format. 
Uh, we have another question. Hold on one second. <clears throat> um, I would like to know what photographers or other visual artists have influenced Storm's work and what contemporary artist he's in conversation with, whether visual arts, literature, etc. cetera. Yeah, ma'am. Cool, thanks. Um, the artists that have influenced me, the photographers and other artists, um, man, there have really been a lot, <laughs> you know, there's things that I've taken from different kind of, from different people, like the early Magnum photographers for sure, you know, um, just that early use of Leica cameras and that, that, that the early photography that kind of like established a certain look, even if it came from street photography that then got refined into like art photography. I think those, you know, David Lachapelle, is his name David Lachapelle, right? Um, I remember seeing his work for the first time and thinking it was just so staged, but it still had so much, it was saying so much, it was so loud. And I remember I didn't want to shoot work like that, but I got it, you know what I mean? Um, there have been, shit, of course, now that you asked the question, all of the name them fly out of my head, but, you know, in terms of filmmakers, you know, like, and films, you know, certain films like City of God, were very influential to me. Certain films like um, Clockwork Orange, you know, Clockwork Orange was super influential from a stylistic kind of perspective. Um, and uh, I'm going to think of more names and I'll kind of add them in there as I go. But I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm watching a lot of films and every once in a while I come across um, artwork that really, that really like moves me, you know? Um, yeah. Yo, know, my turn. Go on, let, get, you can ask me the next question. Uh, let me just turn on this light, right? I get dark. Ah, well, I don't have one ready just yet, anyway. So we wait for you to come back. <laughs> All right. oh, hold on. Now there is one. Oh, um, someone asking if you watched Small Axe and your thoughts on it. Um, I actually have not been able to watch Small Axe yet. I really want to. Um, you know, Shabir Kirshner is his name. Filmmaker, really cool. Guy, I know him. I'm actually been hearing a lot about the cinematography. So I actually really want to see it. So I don't have thoughts yet, but um, I will soon. <laughs> um, you know, other films that influence, other thing that influenced me, influence a lot of cinematographers, like I Am Cuba. You know that film? If anybody who, you know, if you don't know it, you need to watch it. It's on YouTube. It is the most, one of the most beautiful films ever made. Um, also music videos like Hype Williams, you know, I watched Belly the other night again, his feature film, and I kind of hadn't seen it in so long and I was reminded like, damn, I, I remember seeing this for the first time and how much this kind of affected me. And um, other people that have been like paradigm shifting artists have been like Khalil Joseph, it's all coming back to me now, right? <laughs> Khalil Joseph. You know, I remember seeing Khalil Joseph's first work with Shabazz Palaces. Um, and to me, there's so many, there's a whole genre of filmmaking and especially like short format filmmaking that is essentially Khalil Joseph. Like there's like a gazillion directors now that are like Khalil Joseph-esque. He kind of, you know, so, so that influenced me. The fact that he was using work that felt very home video-ish but how he edited the work and the music, it just made it ethereal. And it, I'm always trying to capture, I think maybe even, you know, the surreal, even the, the connection with surrealism, like I am trying to have an ethereal effect, like even in film stuff or otherwise, I kind of want there to be a sensory experience and I want the work to kind of feel like it's floating or, or the art to make you feel that way, the work to make you feel that way, you know? Um, and I'll think of, of, of who else, you know? Um, certain filmmakers like Ponte Corvo, you know, um, Battle for Algiers. You know, there's movies that have kind of like helped to define my style and refine it, you know? Would that apply to your style as a filmmaker, as a photographer, as an artist, both, all mm. of it? I, I find as I've become oh, like- right. I find as I become more, you know, like, you know, you, you become better or more refined, uh, like as a director, I, be I become better and better and quicker and quicker as an editor, because you just know, and I, I'm more comfortable with knowing 
what draws me and excites me. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I do find in my, the stuff I'm doing in my film work is coming up in my artwork, is coming up in other things. Like I'm writing, is the thing, the, like my life right now, and that's what's been, you know, this pandemic has been crazy, obviously in so many ways, but you know, for me, it definitely allowed me to like, I was like, you know, let me just do the things I really want to do. And that's when I really started to like push with this work, I feel. Um, and, you know, I just found that, you know, I'm writing treatments for movies. I'm writing treatments for TV shows. I'm writing scripts. You know, I'm going into my photography work. I've started carving stuff. I've started working with metal. And the images that I kind of am coming up with keep going into this place and I don't even intend them to. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Because I'm influenced by all type of stuff, but it always ends up in this kind of odd spot. So clearly there's something I'm trying to get at, whether the, you know, even my films are tonally quite different, but they're definitely stabbing at a similar thing. So, I mean, so there's a lot of work that's been created during this pandemic and we potentially can look forward to a larger exhibition somewhere, right? Um, would you, I mean, have you ever actually, and I don't know the answer that, like presented your photography and any film work, whether that be um, feature length of installations of some sort, um, together in some way, or has that always been um, separate at this point? They, they've honestly, up to this point, mostly been separate. My dream, my goal, what I really want to do is to show my work, this work in the right space for it, and then have my film work programmed you know, in the same space or along the same thing or with its own schedule so that people can really, you know, that, that's my dream as an artist, like in terms of I would like people to see stuff. I don't want to be like, oh, this is my stuff over here, my stuff over there. I feel like all the work is connected. I feel like I can't help but try to say similar things. And I think it's not always obvious, but if you see all the work, you're going to see it. You know, to right. me, you see the same themes. So I have not shown them much together, but I think they absolutely go together. And I would, I'm, I'm trying, I'm looking forward to that. Like, I want to do that. I want to be in some museum somewhere with my <laughs> photography on the wall or my installation, whatever. And then my films are programmed to play alongside it. I'm a multidisciplinary artist. Like I, I can't, <laughs> you know, sometimes when you're trying to be a filmmaker again, not trying to be, I am a filmmaker, obviously, but you're trying to be bigger and bigger and get further and further. It's like, mastering it and just being refined you're just the director it becomes this thing that you think helps repel you but you can't deny the other work and sometimes the other work is some of your best work <laughs> you know what i mean so yeah, I agree. yeah i'm trying to embrace that and and that's kind of what led to me doing this and you know i'm really grateful to Suzanne also, you know, just for like being consistent, you know, I showed her the work. She was like, okay, yeah, <laughs> something's here. And, you know, there's a lot of people and I've been trying to kind of do it alongside and, you know, you know, it's just cool to be able to like show the work and have these conversations instead of it just living there and people only knowing my film stuff. You know? Awesome. Well, I mean, next steps taken in 2021, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> So I think I think we have no more question at this point, and we've been talking for quite some time. So I I don't know if um, Suzanne wants to say anything else to close it out. But um, hold on, what is she saying? Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks to everyone who tuned in. It was wonderful, and thanks again for the opportunity for this conversation. It's always great to see you, even if it's virtually. <laughs> <laughs> Both of you. So. Thank you. Just, thank you, Heike. Well, I think I, I really enjoyed that conversation. Thank you both. I think it's really important um, to to really help people understand artistic process and practice, and Heike's fluency with how to speak about that, especially her very close relationship to dancehall culture. There's so much you can get around like when you're Jamaican and into popular culture. There's so much you can get. Um, that's kind of abstracted around the work. It's very evocative emotionally for me. I find it very strong. And uh, the more abstract worded works, I mean, I could talk forever about how, I mean, for me, when you guys were talking about the uneasiness piece, I was thinking of the uneasiness of the Jamaican male 
you know it might be performative it might be hyper masculine but there's there's a there's an unease there yeah. and uh the the flight of birds and the the, the the inability to escape your your everyday reality and all those kind of things i mean it's so layered and so um so powerful i think so i'm really happy to be working with storm with this work glad we can have a conversation about it so other people can hear about his process and stuff and to have Heike um lead that conversation was a real joy thank you Heike thanks everyone for coming um we're going to be uh archiving this on the website i will be emailing out links please feel free to share and it's the first of the exchange series so we're going to continue on this on this um path no love thank you Heike thank you Suzanne thank you everybody for tuning in cool bye. all right guys bye bye